here's an overview of the character counter that I made. It's got this LCD screen that shows you the dose rate, the cancer mat, and also the total accumulated dose. Um, it's actually a touch screen. I'll talk more about the touch functions in a little bit. Um, I've got it in this 3D printed case that has this weird looking front end that flares out. And that's because I have the Geiger tube in there. I'm using this SBM20 Geiger Miller tube. It's an old Soviet tube. It's easy to find on eBay and it's pretty cheap. And it's also um, quite sensitive to beta and gamma, especially for its size. So that makes it ideal for a project like this. Um, I just wanted to have it up there in that orientation so that I can just point it at things and get the reading that way, but it does make it a little bulky. Alright, here's what it looks like on the inside. Um, there's the Geiger tube sticking out, and then everything else is on this PCB that I custom designed. Um, looking at the back here, it's powered by this 18650 lithium ion cell. Um, I'm using the ESP8266 board as my microcontroller. And then this module here is the high voltage power supply. It's a DC to DC boost converter, but it works at really high voltages. Uh, I'm currently supplying 430 volts-ish to the Geiger tube. Um, 400 is about the recommended voltage for most Geiger tubes like this. Um, you can see that I had to do some rework, add some jumpers uh, to the PCB, and that's because I ordered the PCB before I actually had any of my components, so I couldn't test anything on the breadboard to make sure that it worked. So I just had to fix a few things, but I finally got it working. Um, so the Geiger tube has 400 volts applied to it, and then Normally, no current flows through it, but when ionizing radiation, like a beta particle or a gamma photon, passes through it, it can ionize some of the gas molecules in there. And that results in a small pulse of current that passes through, and that can be detected. Um, well, it's actually not the current that's detected, it's a spike in voltage at the ground side of the negative side of the Geiger tube. Um, there's some uh, resistors and capacitors and a transistor to work with the signal and turn it into a nice and clean square wave that can then be fed into the microcontroller. And then it acts as an interrupt so the microcontroller can then count the number of pulses, um, do calculations with it, display it on the screen, etc. Alright, going back to the device itself and what it shows on the screen, uh, it has this battery level indicator up top. I found that with a full charge, um, it should last about 10 to 12 hours of use, which I don't think is too bad, especially considering it's a prototype. Um, the rest of the screen is separated into these blocks, which I think make the information look a little more organized and easy to read. Um, the first block here shows the effective dose rate in microsieverts per hour in big numbers because that's usually the most relevant piece of information that you want to see from a Geiger counter. And that's actually calculated from the count per minute. Um, that's also displayed down here. Below that is the cumulative dose, or which is just the total accumulated counts and the microsieverts since it was turned on. Right now, it's just displaying the natural background radiation. Um, it usually fluctuates between 15 to 30-ish counts per minute where I am, but it does change a little bit. Um, I do have some radioactive sources to demonstrate that um, the Kyrie counter does actually detect ionizing radiation. Here's a tiny little vial that contains some pieces of uranium ore and you'll see that 
when I place it next to the tube, it does pick up an activity, although it's not it's not a huge amount. You can see it rising. Um, I also have this. This is a thoriated lantern mantle. It contains thorium, which obviously is radioactive, and so you can see that it actually picks up quite a bit of radiation. Yeah, the source is quite active. And you may have noticed that the counts keep rising and they're not leveling up yet. And that's because um, the count per minute is actually calculated by taking the rolling average, or rather the rolling sum of the last minute, the last 60 seconds. Um, and 60 seconds is a good integration time if you're measuring low levels of radiation like natural background that's quite accurate but if you're measuring um, a source with high activity or if you're in an area that has high radiation levels and you want to see how quickly you want to see if the radiation levels change quickly um, you will want to switch it to fast mode which changes the integration time to just 3 seconds instead of 60. So you'll see that it picks up a lot more quickly and then it levels off after just 3 seconds to about 17 microsieverts per hour with this um, lantern mantle pressed right against the window. So yeah, that's, um, that's useful if you're in an area with high levels of radiation or if you just don't want to wait um, 60 seconds. It is less accurate, especially at lower doses, so there is that trade-off. I'll just switch it back to slow mode. Um, I have these buttons that let me toggle the LED or the buzzer on or off individually. So if I, you can see that the LED is currently blinking. And if I toggle it off, that turns off or I can just turn the buzzer off if I want to be more discreet or if the um, clicks get annoying and I just want to get the readings um, I thought that would be a useful thing to add anyway um, there's a button that says reset count and that's just what it does it resets the counts to zero and then it starts over um, as you can see go back to zero. You can't really see it with this sample because it goes up so quickly, but it just zeroes it out and then starts over. Um, it does not reset the cumulative count. That can only be reset by turning it off. Alright, the next thing is the settings button and it takes you to this basic settings menu. It just has three options. Um, the first one says dose units and that just lets you change the dose uh, units from REM, I mean from sievers to REM if you want. REM is an older non-SI unit that's still used in the US in the nuclear industry I think. And what it does is it changes your dose rate to milliRAMs per hour instead of microsieverts and then it also converts the total dose from microsieverts to milliRAMs. Uh, there you can see it's a different unit, but it just depends on your preference. Um, I'll change it back to Sieverts. And then the second one, it says Alert Threshold. And then that just changes the dose rate at which this green boundary goes red. And then uh, you see a red banner that says High Radiation Level. Um, so if I change it to say 3 instead of 5, it will now, you'll see that it goes from normal background to elevated activity at 1 microsievert, and then once it passes that threshold, it goes to high radiation level, and then the screen boundary also goes red. Um, 
I didn't want to have an alarm that was too like loud or one that beeped or flashed or anything but this is enough to give you a warning and you can change the uh, the alert threshold to any number you want in one microsievert per hour increments. Um, the final one is called calibration and that just lets you change the conversion factor that relates the counts per minute to uh, the microsievert per hour reading. Um, this conversion factor depends not only on the tube design itself but also on the kind of radiation you're measuring. So like the isotope that the radiation is coming from can actually change um, how much dose you receive for a given number of counts per minute. And that's partly because cardio counters are generally a lot more sensitive to beta radiation than to gamma. And so if you have a source that's beta only, for example, strontium-90, you'll get a reading that's a lot higher than um, the dose you're actually getting. And if you have a source that's gamma only, you um, this will underestimate the dose that you're exposed to. So <clears throat> I just wanted to have this option to quickly change it um, if you know what isotope you're going to be measuring. It also means that Geiger counters can only be accurately calibrated to one isotope. Um, the most commonly used isotope for calibrating Geiger counters is cesium-137. And there are many reasons for that. One is that it's a beta and gamma emitter. Um, it's actually a two-step process where it decays through beta radiation into barium-137. Um, it's barium-137M, which means metastable. And then that metastable isotope decays into just stable barium-137 um, through a gamma decay with a much shorter half-life. So what that effectively results in is that half of the emissions from cesium-137 is beta and then half is gamma. And cesium-137 is also one of the more prominent isotopes released from nuclear fission of uranium or plutonium. So in areas where nuclear accidents have happened, like Chernobyl or Fukushima, or in the fallout from nuclear weapons, cesium-137 is one of the more prevalent isotopes. Um, and also, it has a moderate half-life of about 30 years, which it's short enough to be quite active, um, active enough that it's dangerous, but it's also long-lived enough that it sticks around for decades and centuries, and it's just problematic for that reason. And um, so it's a good idea to calibrate gutter counters with CZ-137, um, even though it won't be super accurate if you're measuring any other isotope. So that's calibration. Um, the actual process of calibrating a Geiger counter against a source is a lot more involved. Um, you need a disk source with a known activity, and you also need to know the exact energy profiles and fractions of all the um, beta and gamma emissions. And then you take all that information and then use some formulas to calculate the dose rate at a given distance. And then you can relate the count for a minute at that distance to the dose rate and then find the conversion factor that way for that isotope. Um, I don't have one of those disk sources yet. Um, I did order one, so it should be in the mail. Um, I might make a video about calibrating an SPM20 based carrier counter with a cesium-137 source once I have that. Um, that's about it for the overview. Um, things I could add, right, as in features I could add, would be Wi-Fi and data logging. I think that would be pretty cool to be able to download data into a computer or a phone app through Wi-Fi because I know that the ESP chip I'm using supports Wi-Fi natively, um, but I've never used it yet. So maybe that's something I could add if I keep working on this project. Um, I think that's it. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions, put them in the comments below.
Um, thanks for watching.